can think of meditation as a way of overcoming addictive behavior. With well, the word behavior here meaning not only things you do with the body or substances you take, but also your thoughts. Because thoughts are addictive. And not just the good ones. And in the same way with addictive substances, the problem is that we take something over and over again, and even though it has lots of drawbacks, we keep doing it. Thoughts of greed, thoughts of aversion, thoughts of delusion, thoughts by which we harm ourselves are addictive. You wouldn't think that we would develop these addictions, but we do partly out of force of habit, and partly out of an inability to th imagine ourselves doing anything any way else, thinking any way else, feeling any way else. And so the meditation, we have to have a technique, something to focus on, another way of thinking to remind yourself there are other ways of reacting to feelings of pain, feelings of discomfort. Feelings of loneliness, feelings of depression, everything by which we tend to harm ourselves. So focus on your breath. This is the way out. When anything comes up, keep coming back to the breath. Take a couple of good long, deep in and out breaths and notice where you feel the breathing sensations in the body. And notice whether they feel refreshing, because it's important if you're going to change your behavior, you have to have an attractive alternative to your old ways. And if the breathing feels good, feels energizing, it's hitting old addictive behavior right at its source. Because for most of us, it's this funny, uncomfortable feeling in the body that causes us to give in to addictions. This unpleasant feeling that we can't seem to get out of our system and think, well, the only way I've dealt with this in the past is to think in these ways or try to arrange these situations or take this substance. And it gives a momentary pleasure. But here's something that's more lasting. Learn how to get that same pleasure simply by the way you breathe. Try to let the sensation of breathing feel comfortable all the way down, even to the most sensitive parts of the body, which may be in the throat, in the chest, wherever you find that your feelings tend to be most sensitive. Allow the breath to comfort those, to soothe those, to give energy, whatever that part of the body seems to need. And stick with it. Because in the beginning it may not seem all that satisfying, and you haven't yet built up the, the metal structure around it that your old addictions do have. Because that's a large part of the addiction, is that all the justifications that you have for giving into that particular addiction that the mind tells itself, or one part of the mind tells the rest of the mind, well, you need to have people around, you need to have this, you need to have that in order to feel at ease. We build this huge structure of excuses and values and ideas to justify our old behavior. This applies not only to gross addictions, but also to more subtle ones. Our addiction to worry, our addiction to ill will, our addiction to sensual desires, our addiction to doubt, all the hindrances. of this big superstructure of justifications. If you're worried about something, you really got to worry about it. This really is an important issue, and if you don't take care of it now, if you don't just drive yourself crazy with worry, you're not being responsible. I mean, that's what the mind tells itself. And every other lack that the mind has, every other unskillful habit the mind has, it has a lot of justification to tell yourself why you have to do it this way. 
if it really were good, you wouldn't have to justify it. I and mean, that's what the word justification basically means, is you're doing something you know is not really skillful, it's not really satisfying. But you have to have some way of telling yourself, well, it's good enough. So one part of the meditation is learning how to remind yourself, yeah, this is a lot better. It's a pleasure that's totally harmless, totally blameless. In fact, getting the mind into right concentration is an expression of right resolve. It's part of the path. You want to wean your mind away from its addiction to sensual, sensual passion. And here it means not just the sensual object, but we like to think about sensual pleasures. Even when the pleasures are not around, we get a lot of pleasure somehow out of thinking about them, anticipating them, or remembering old pleasures, forgetting that the actual pleasures themselves are pretty fleeting. You know, the only reason we get worked up about them is this habit the mind has of embroidering them and making them seem more than they actually were. As the mind comes to meditation, comes to concentration, you're also expressing your desire not to be giving into ill will. You're having good will for yourself, good will for others. Here you are working on a pleasure, on a happiness, a sense of well-being, a clarity of mind that doesn't harm you, doesn't harm the people around you. So as we're sitting here, it's an expression of right resolve working on getting the mind to settle down. So remind yourself of that. This is part of the path to the end of suffering. And if you haven't reached that result yet, this is where the Buddha has you develop a sense of conviction in the importance of training the mind, in the importance of your actions. Those two things are connected because your actions come out of your mind. The decisions you make depend on the state of mind you're in. If the mind is in a good state, it's going to do it's much more likely to do skillful things, to say skillful things, think skillful things. In the beginning you may not have all the evidence you want, but as a general principle, we all know that taking responsibility for your actions tends to have a lot better results than just hoping that somebody else is going to do things for you. And the Buddha is showing by his example, and that's the example of all of his noble disciples, that it's by training your mind, developing good qualities of mind, that true happiness can be found. So until we've seen that happen in our minds, until that truth is verified, it has to be taken on conviction. But then you ask yourself, if you don't have conviction in this, what do you have conviction in? Because the fact that we act shows that we're convinced of something. Otherwise, we wouldn't make the energy. We wouldn't put forth the energy to try to keep acting. We say, "Well, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Doesn't matter what I do." And then we just kind of lie back and, well, you know what happens to people who think that way? They're miserable. So part of the meditation is learning how to keep that conviction alive. And then you strengthen it by focusing on the breath and finding there are ways of breathing that feel really good. And it puts the mind in a much better mood. And it may come and go, but you're exploring. Keep remembering that you're working on a skill, you're developing new habits. That's not the case. You get the mind into concentration once and it's going to stay that way forever. It takes a while for your center of gravity to shift so that the state of concentration does become more normal. The state of being in the present moment, mindful and alert, becomes more normal. If you've ever worked on a physical skill, sports, carpentry, music, you know that originally the moments where everything just seems to come together are pretty far, few and far between. But with practice, they become more often and they become more continuous. 
the advantage of meditation is you're focusing on exactly why they become more continuous, i.e. it's the, the qualities of mindfulness and alertness you're developing as you meditate. That's why the Buddha said that learning is an important part of the practice, i.e. learning the Dharma, listening to the Dharma. Because if you don't listen to the Dharma, what are you listening to? You're listening to all those voices of the media out there, and who knows what other voices you picked up. And you have to ask yourself, well, what's the intention behind those voices? What, are they, what were they trying to get out of me, and how did I let them come in and become part of the voices of my own mind? What you think of the voice of the Buddha? He was someone who attained total happiness, didn't need anything from anyone else. All he had was to, things to offer, saying, here, look, you can do this for yourself. You can train your own mind. This is where the image of the mind as a committee is useful, because different parts of the mind are more skillful than others, and you take the skillful parts and you make them stronger, basically. Everything the Buddha taught was out of pure compassion. So that's the voice you want to have in your mind, and the shoulds of the Buddha's voice. Suffering, he said, is something you should try to comprehend. Otherwise you don't just push it away. You try to develop the path. That's another one of his shoulds. Develop the concentration, the mindfulness, so you can have a sense of well-being and a sense of steadiness, so you can watch the suffering and not feel threatened by it. And when you comprehend it, you'll also come to see what's causing it. Once you see the cause, that's something you should abandon. So ultimately, the, the final should is so you should realize the end of suffering. These are all good shoulds. They all have your true happiness in mind. Not, the sh not like the shoulds of society, which have a lot of other agendas. So these are the voices you want to develop. This is the new superstructure you want to develop in the mind to keep reminding yourself, okay, when the mind slips off to its old habits, hey, here's something better over here, and you can do it. It may take time. There'll be times when the practice seems to advance and sometimes when it seems to retreat, but that's just a normal part of developing any skill, especially a skill as subtle as training the mind. So that's why you learn how not to get discouraged. This is why the meditation has both techniques, give you something alternative, an alternative to do besides your old addictive habits. And it also gives you some reasons, some motivations to stick with this, these new techniques, these new habits, until you have them firmly in hand. So work with the breath. Find where the breath feels most comfortable in the body. Find where the spots in the body that most need a sense of ease or a sense of healing from the breath, whether they need to be soothed or energized. Just notice what the breath can do. And you're going to have plenty of breaths to work with, plenty of breaths to observe in the next hour. So try to make the most out of each one. <laughs>